questions on the material so far? Oh, hold on, I'll get my pointer. Okay, um, so last time we discussed the role of race in health treatments and in health outcomes. We sort of thought a little bit about conceptually about the causal role of race, uh, if any, in different sorts of outcomes. Uh, we talked about ways of distinguishing different kinds of disparities and a little bit about the role of ethnically patterned patient preferences. We talked about the role of physician decision making and of geography in race based differences in health. And we talked a little bit about the difference between bias, stereotyping, and uncertainty. Well, let's refresh for today, let's refresh our memory a little bit about different ways of defining health and of defining medical conditions. And most of you, I think virtually all of you, completed that exercise that we had, which I hope, uh, raise your hands if when you're completing that exercise, you begin to change your mind about illness and disease. And it's sort of interesting, and I, I mean, those, those, uh, those, those, could, that exercise is modeled on something that first appeared in the literature about 20 years ago with British medical students, and I added a whole bunch of other conditions, and, you know, when I first took that exercise, I don't even remember when, um, it really began to change my way of thinking about things, and a lot of the stuff, I mean, if you put your, I hope many of you put your minds, or you put yourselves in the position of the professor, and you think about, why is my professor saying this or doing this, do you do this? You should do this. This is a good thing. Like especially with exams, I think if I were the professor, what you know, what would the sneaky son of a gun try to do, and what would be a reasonable you know thing to do? So it's a really good skill. Uh, and so you probably were thinking, oh my God, I can see why he's pairing these conditions side by side to prompt a set of thoughts in you. Anyway, so uh, so we so we've been thinking about different ways of defining health or defining medical conditions. A few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, we introduced the notion of the statistical standard, which compares people to their peers, the adaptive standard, which compares people to their environment, and the social uh, standard, which compares people to normative um, ideas. And note that this normative standard is not the same as the normality statistical standard that's in the first uh, kind of category. And another way of understanding this social standard is to say that illness is socially constructed. And this social construction of illness is the opposite of essentialism and of positivism, which see social and biological phenomena as given as me and measurable entities with a fundamental essence, and which claim that the truth is knowable solely via the scientific method. So these, this, these, sort of phil these philosophical stances of essentialism and positivism, essentialism is the belief that things have an essence, a key essence that we can discern, and positivism is a kind of belief that we can use science to discern these things. In most or many aspects of my life, I'm a positivist, but actually that kind of positivistic stance uh, conflicts with the notion of social construction, which we're going to be talking a little bit about today, to which I equally, uh, about which I equally feel uh, strongly. Because the argument with respect to social construction is that observations are actively and creatively produced by human beings. From a social construction point of view, knowledge is created, not found. Right? From the scientific point of view, we go out and we find out what's happening in the world. From a social constructivist point of view, we think, well, no, actually, human beings produce this knowledge. Ideas and actions are made or invented and determined by communal norms and expectations. So for example, if you have a racist point of view, you think that one race is inferior to another, then that guides your science, you go out and you discover that that's true, quote unquote, okay? So that's how your social ideas might inform what seemingly you thought was a scientific objective uh, function. So the idea is that social forces shape our understanding of, and crucially, our actions towards illness and health. And to the extent, to the extent that this is the case, then social attributes such as class should also be relevant to how ostensibly, objectively biological phenomena are seen and taxonomized, understood and even treated. Moreover, the fact that illness and our perceptions of bodily processes are socially constructed has implications for patient experience and physician action. And that's the key intellectual point I want you to take home today. That this idea of social construction of illness is not just idle theorizing, 
it affects how doctors treat patients. It changes the world. And as a result of that, we need to take it extremely seriously. Now to punch this point home and to motivate our discussion for today, I thought I would start by discussing a related problem. And here's the familiar visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum that you all know as light with a familiar uh, rainbow of colors. And the colors are listed on the bottom, and I want to draw your attention to two facts. First of all, you probably all feel, with the possible exception of indigo, that these colors make sense. That these are like <laughs> real colors, and that you are familiar with these colors, and that everyone would be familiar and, with these colors. And secondly, and distinctly, you probably all agree on where the names are placed. By and large, you would put these color names at the bottom in roughly the same spots in the electromagnetic spectrum. So you would see green as ending, green as ending somewhere here, and blue beginning. Or uh, red ending, and orange beginning, and then orange ending, and yellow beginning, and so forth. Roughly speaking, you would sort of see where one color shades into another. But it turns out there's very little objective about both of these things, about the number of colors we perceive, and about the boundaries we draw between them. For example, the number of colors we identify might depend on our uh, attributes, like on our sex. Uh, so for example, you can imagine that there could be some kind of difference between men and women in how many colors or where they partition the spectrum uh, might be. And this is obviously a, a jokey cartoon, I think, I, I think taken from XABC, I can't remember. But, uh, but people have done experiments like this, and men and women might differ, for instance, in the number of colors that they partition uh, the space in. But let's look at some more experimental results from a large-scale, worldwide investigation of this phenomenon. And on the top is a standard set of stimuli using uh, what is known, uh, that was used in what was called the World Color Survey. And this shows a palette of 330 individual colors which were sewn separately one color at a time to native speakers of each of 110 languages in non-industrialized countries. So people took a little stack of 330 colored chips, all those colored chips at the top, and went to 110 uh, non-industrialized societies around the world and showed people, members of those cultural groups, one color at a time and asked them, what color is this? What color is this? What color is this? And then the modal response the, the, uh, the, the fraction of subjects that was the largest that identified a given color as one color, that was taken to be how people in that society named that color chip, what color uh, they thought it was. So the largest number of speakers of each language results uh, who identify color as, as having a particular name creates the so-called mode map that's shown in the lower panel, uh, for example. And I think, uh, I think this is the mode map of, uh, of the Lili people. And, they have, and their language uh, has four major categories. Uh, black, white, red, and yellow. Those are the four colors that those people see, and, or, or name. And so they named all these colors, including things that you and I might call green or blue. They're all called by the same thing that they call the yellow color. And these were reds, and these were reds. And these dark colors, including some of these sort of darker blues, were all called as black. So they defined the color spectrum as having four components, not Roy G. Biv like we do. And this is where they draw the boundaries between their four colors that they see when they're shown these colors uh, one at a time. And interestingly, there are clear universals and also differences in color naming across society. Uh, such that the, both the number of recognized colors and the boundaries of the colors vary from place to place. So the recognition of colors is at least in part socially constructed and transcends the physics of the situation. So it's not just about the electromagnetic spectrum and the wavelength of this light. Something about people's culture determines how many colors they have and how many colors uh, and where they draw the boundaries uh, between the colors. <coughs> And there's a further key point that we will also explore today, namely that once constructed, such categories can have effects. For example, the controversial WARF, W-H-O-R-F hypothesis, which was propounded in the 1950s, holds that semantic differences between languages induces differences in perception and or cognition. The idea is that language differences, you're born and you learn a particular language, the claim was that this language changed how you thought, changed how you saw the world. 
And so, and this is a controversial, the scientists have been going back and forth about this idea, and recently this idea has been resurrected in a, in a number of interesting ways. And so the question is, do linguistically coded color categories induce actual differences in color discrimination? Are you less able to see the difference between yellow and blue and green if you're a member of this cultural group than some other cultural group? Here's some example of people who identify three colors and where they draw the boundaries. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the Wobe and the Ivory Coast, the Bete and the Ivory Coast, and, uh, and another group here in Nigeria, Cameroon, shown on the left. They have red, black, and white are the colors and where they draw the distinctions. Here are people who identify five colors and where they draw the boundaries from around the world, in Papua New Guinea, in Ecuador, another group in Ecuador. And you can see there's some overlap in where they draw them, but also differences. In, uh, in where they draw the boundaries. And here are examples of people who identify six colors and where they draw the boundaries. And here the final division between five and six colors tends to be whether you see a difference or, or identify a difference between blue and green colors. Now to be clear, the issue is, is also whether people even see the difference. So it's not just do you, do you use one word for blue and green, but if I point them out to you and say, isn't this a little different, this color, than that color? Just like we might say, well, we, we call something orange, but we can see differences in shades of orange. The question is, do people actually, are they more or less able to see the differences between these colors if they grew up in an environment which had a different mode of map uh, in the color scheme? So do you see differences between shades of green, or do the conventions in the society in which you were raised make you fail to distinguish, i.e. fail even to see them. And it turns out there's evidence for the latter. A recent paper actually by Franklin and PNAS involved experiments with a gaze of toddlers found that the color discrimination shifted from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere of the brain once the toddlers acquired terms for the relevant color categories. And so language may influence the functional organization of the brain when it comes to color discrimination. And similar arguments have been made about sounds, such that native speakers of tonal languages, such as Chinese, for example, may hear differences that we do not. And of course, there are always people, artists and musicians, for example, in any society that may see or hear more than the rest of us. But those individual differences are yet again another matter. Okay? So we can make group comparisons between people recognizing that within each group, there might be exceptional individuals you know, who have really excellent discrimination when it comes to color or sound or whatever. Or consider the work, or consider the work of uh, of Vera Boroditsky regarding the way a group in a, in a Australia, an Aboriginal group called the Kukthayor, talk about space. And instead of words like right and left and forward and back, which are commonly used in English to define and which define space relative to the observer, the Kukthayori, like many other Aboriginal groups, use cardinal direction terms like north, south, east, and west to define space. And they do this at all scales, which results in them doing things that would, to our eye and ear, sound ridiculous. Like they might say, there's an ant on your southeast leg. Or they might say, move the cup to the north-northwest a little bit. And so they don't speak in the way that you and I might think about space. They speak in a completely different way about space. And one obvious consequence of speaking such a language is that you need to stay oriented in cardinal space at all times. You need to know where all the cardinal directions are if you're going to describe where anything is in your world or talk to anyone about any kind of spatial uh, topic. And the normal greeting, for example, among the Kukthayor is, where are you going? And the answer might be something like, south, southeast, in the middle distance. People would describe themselves that way. And this result, the result of this is a profound difference in navigational ability and spatial knowledge between speakers of languages that rely primarily on absolute reference frames like the Kukthayore, and languages that rely on relative reference frames, like English. In fact, speakers of languages like Kukthayore are much better than English speakers at staying oriented and keeping track of where they are, even in unfamiliar landscapes, or even inside unfamiliar buildings. And what enables them, in fact, what forces them to do this is their language. Having their attention trained in this way equips them to perform navigational feats once thought beyond human capabilities. You can take these individuals and put them in a place that they've never been before, and they can navigate through it in a way that would confound you and me uh, quite a bit. And as linguist Roman Jacobson pointed out, languages differ essentially in what they must convey, 
but not in what they may convey. Languages can oblige the users to think about particular topics and in particular ways. And because space is such a fundamental domain of thought, differences in how people think about space don't just end there. People rely on their spatial knowledge to build other, more complex, more abstract representations of other ideas. For example, ideas about time. So if Kukta Yori, Yori people think differently about space, do they also think differently about other things like time? So to test this idea, Boroditsky gave people sets of pictures that showed some kind of temporal progression. For example, a, a human being aging from a baby to a young person to an older person to a middle-aged person to an old person. So photographs of a human being aging. Or, for example, something like a banana being eaten. Here's the whole banana, now it's peeled, now portions of it are missing, that clearly indicate the progression of time. And these cards on which these photographs are, were given were given to members of the Kuktayori group, and they were asked to arrange, they were shuffled, and they were asked to arrange them on the ground in a correct temporal order. And she tested each person in two separate sittings, each time facing a different cardinal direction. Now, if you ask English speakers to do this, if I asked all of you guys to do this, you would take these cards and what would you do with them? You would arrange them left to right. You wouldn't even need to be told. You'd start with a baby and you'd get older. The banana and then the banana's consumed. Or if you gave them to a native Hebrew speaker, for example, they might do it right to left, or Japanese speaker. They might start on the right and move to the left. But if you give them to a kuktayori, what do they do? If they're facing in one direction, they put the cards heading away from their body. And if they're facing in the other direction, they have the cards coming towards their body. So the temporal order in which they arrange the cards depends on how they're oriented in space. So their way of thinking about space spills over and affects how they think about time as well, is the claim that Borditsky is making. Um, So language affects their thinking and also uh, their actions. Here's another nice example of how language can affect thought and action, because languages indeed differ widely in the ways they encode time and not just space. For example, they differ in when they require speakers to specify the timing of events and when timing can be left unsaid. For example, if you wanted to explain to an English-speaking colleague why you can't attend a meeting later today, you could, say, you could not say, I go to a seminar, because English grammar would oblige you to say, I will go, or am going, or have to go to a seminar. But if, on the other hand, you were speaking Mandarin, it would be quite natural for me to omit any marker of future time and say in Chinese, I go listen seminar. And in this way, English forces its speakers to habitually divide time between the present and the future in a way that Mandarin, which has no tenses, does not. This does not mean that Mandarin speakers don't know the difference between the future and the present. It just means that that's relatively less emphasized in their normal speech compared to speakers of English. An economist, Keith Chen, tested the hypothesis that languages like Chinese that grammatically associate the future and the present foster future-oriented behavior. Because now you don't see a difference between the future and the present. They seem like they're the same thing to you compared to English speakers who might draw a distinction between the two. And, and Keith asked, does this affect how people uh, save for the future? Do you discount the future differently if you're obliged constantly to think about the future uh, in a different way? And he found that speakers of such weak future tense uh, reference languages save more retire with more wealth, smoke less, practice safer sex, and are less obese. And this holds both across countries and within countries comparing demographically similar households. So here, here he looks at savings rates uh, in these countries, and he found on average countries which speak, which have strong FDR languages, save 4.75% less. So the light bar countries are weak FDR languages, uh, future tense reference, and the dark ones are strong. So the United States, saves less because we draw a distinction between the future and the present. But if you don't draw a distinction between the two, you think, oh, my future self is going to need this money. I don't need to spend it uh, in my uh, today's self. So again, the point is not that people can't tell the difference between the future and the present and the past. It's that the language is obliged and changes their way of thinking and then is translated into action in how you sort cards if you're a kukayori or whether you save money, for example, in this case. And something like these ideas isn't working at, at, in medicine. 
So let's start with the example of plastic surgery. Whether you judge a nose to be in need of medical attention depends not on the objective reality of the nose, but rather on social norms. And 3% of you in the survey you completed thought a large nose was a medical problem, and 5% of you thought it was a concern for doctors. And we all know, but yet, so in small minorities of you thought this, yet we all know that nose jobs, rhinoplasties, are a huge industry in the United States. 500,000 people seek evaluation each year, and 250,000 people have surgery to adjust their noses in some of the examples shown here. We have 14 million plastic surgery procedures each year in this country, and we spend over $10 billion, uh, depending on how you count what counts. So our ideas about the body and what's a normal nose affects what physicians do to our bodies, what we want to do to our bodies, and what doctors actually do. People cut you open, and you submit to being cut open, because of what you think of as a normal nose or not. There's no objective reality to this. It's a social construction of what counts as a normally shaped uh, nose. And this young woman, for example, wanted her nose adjusted and had it adjusted after doing a, a procedure. And this boy is much happier with his ears. He has what is called a setback otoplasty. He had ears that were kind of, you know, I don't know if you guys, well, there are all kinds of sort of mean terms that kids in elementary school, you know, like Dumbo ears and stuff like that, that people use. And so the boy was really, you know, didn't like this, and these are shots at the top and at the bottom, and he had a little procedure which sets back uh, his ears. So we construct our ideas about what our body should be like, and we see them in a particular way, and then we apply medical technologies accordingly, in the case at least of plastic surgery. But today, however, we'll be examining these ideas of social construction, mostly through the lens of women's health and Emily Martin's remarkable book. And I should stress that this is not restricted to women's health issues, though this is a particularly rich example uh, of social construction. Now this is, uh, this is the typical diagram of a menstrual cycle, cycle probably familiar to all of you uh, from high school. So in high school biology, you all learned about this. You learned about the fluctuating levels of estrogen and progesterone. Here's the monthly cycle. You get, uh, here's what's happening to the egg. Uh, the egg is maturing, uh, and then you know, the follicle around is maturing, and the egg bursts, and the egg is released, and it coincides with a spike in, uh, in the estrogen level, which sort of proceeds, and then this happens once the egg is released, the, uh, the, the uh, follicle converts into the corpus luteum, which then begins to produce progesterone. Meanwhile, here's what's happening in the endometrium. You get the proliferation stage, where the endometrial lining is getting more and more vascular and producing more and more mucus. Uh, here's the secretive stage, and then eventually, when there's an abrupt drop in progesterone, the menstrual uh, lining is shed, and this becomes the menses, which is expelled uh, through the vagina. And you all learned, all, all of you learned this in, uh, in high school biology and saw images like this, and probably formed the opinion that this was a being very objectively and clinically described uh, uh, to you. And here's one textbook de de definition of menstruation. The sudden lack of these two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, causes the blood vessels of the endometrium to become spastic, so that blood flow to the surface layers of the endometrium almost ceases. As a result, much of the endometrial tissue dies and it sloughs into the uterine cavity. Then the small amounts of blood ooze from the diluted endometrial wall, causing a blood loss of about 50 milliliters during the next few days. The sloughed endometrial tissue, plus the blood in much serous exudate from the denuded uterine surface, altogether called the menstruum, is gradually expelled by intermittent contractions of the uterine muscle for about three to five days, and this process is called menstruation. And most of you read descriptions like this in your textbooks or other books when you were young. But notice all the decay and failure here. The lack of uh, these two hormones causes spasm, and then they're ceasing, and dying, and sloughing, and oozing, and denuding, and more loss, and more sloughing, and more denuding, and more expelling. This whole, whole way of describing this process is not devoid of language that has meaning. It's being described in a very particular way, which Emily Martin very effectively calls into question, first by highlighting it, and then by exploring its implications. And contrast this with the process of failed reproduction in men. The mechanism which guides the remarkable cellular transformation from spermatid to mature sperm remains uncertain. Perhaps the most amazing characteristic of spermatogenesis is its sheer magnitude. The normal human male may manufacture several hundred million sperm per day. Wow! I mean, this is like an incredible achievement, right, compared to the sloughing and denuding and dying. 
uh, that's taking place, you know, on the other side uh, of the wall. And there's no discussion here about the wasting of sperm, the spilling of sperm, the sloughing of sperm, where all the sperm that's being produced is going, you know. None of this is discussed in this situation. It's a very different uh, example. And Martin draws attention to these differences. And contrast that, Martin says, with a similar but not identical physiologic process that happens in both men and women, kind of a more neutral process. So she says, okay, well, where else is things like this happening, and how are they described? So she thinks about what happens in the lining of the stomach. The primary function of the gastric secretions is to begin the digestion of proteins. Unfortunately, though, the wall of the stomach is itself constructed mainly of smooth muscle, which itself is mainly protein. Therefore, the surface of the stomach must be exceptionally well protected at all times against its own digestion. The function is performed mainly by mucus that is secreted in great abundance in all parts of the stomach. The entire surface of the stomach is covered by a layer of very small mucus cells, which themselves are composed almost entirely of mucus. This mucus prevents gastric secretions from ever touching the deeper layers of the stomach wall. So Martin's point is that we see menstruation in a particular way, and we describe it in a particular way, and that these two are related, and that they are not arbitrary. Our perception of what would seemingly be a very normal physiologic function, namely menstruation, is socially constructed. There's nothing scientific about the way that process is described or seen. And as we shall see, such views of bodily processes have implications. Now, Martin criticizes all of this, uh, but she then goes a step further. And she provides a physiologically accurate, but socially reconstructed way of describing the same phenomenon. So when I first read Martin's book 20 years, 30 years ago, I was reading it and I was like, oh, for God's sakes, this is ridiculous. I mean, she, they're just describing menstruation. There's nothing wrong with saying sloughing or denuding. She's just going too far, you know, could she please just relax, uh, was my perception. And then I started reading the other examples, and then I read this thing, which hit me like a bullet in the brain, because what Martin's about to do is give a scientifically correct description of the same process that's completely different. Here's her description. A drop in the formerly high levels of progesterone and estrogen creates the appropriate environment for reducing the excess layers of endometrial tissue. Constriction of capillary blood vessel, vessels causes a lower level of oxygen and nutrients, and paves the way for a vigorous production of menstrual fluids. As part of the renewal of the remaining endometrium, the capillaries begin to reopen, part of the renewal process now, contributing some blood and serous fluid to the volume of endometrial material already beginning to flow. There's nothing wrong with that description. It's entirely correct and totally different than the other description that is the kind of description you all saw in your textbooks. And the point, of course, is that, con that conditions are judged by a social and normative standard. And whether we see something as pathological can depend on who we are, where we stand, and when we are alive. And you showed this yourselves in the exercise you did for the class. Here are some initial ways that you uh, constructed illness. So 4% uh, of you thought a large nose was a disease, 5% of concern of doctors. 2% of you thought homosexuality was a disease. And an even larger percent thought that it was a concern of doctors. I don't quite know why it would be a concern of doctors if it's not a disease, but there was some difference there. Uh, road rage. 12% of you thought road rage was a disease. 26% thought doctors should do something about road rage. PMS, 24% uh, thought that PMS was a disease. 50% thought doctors should do something about PMS. Uh, <laughs> Uh, back pain, 27%, 67% thought it was a concern of doctors. Obesity, 67% of you thought obesity was a disease. You guys. Uh, and 94% of you thought it was a concern of doctors. Uh, ADHD, 61 and 79%. Alcoholism, 66 and 86%. Hay fever, 74 and 92 And anorexia, 88 and 92%. So even though rhinoplasty is one of the most common surgical procedures, you did not consider having a big nose to be a problem but obesity hits your radar screens. And as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, some of these conditions, such as back pain and anorexia, show substantial cross-cultural variation and may even be seen as culture-bound syndromes and might not be considered diseases at all by other people in other cultures, just like the differences in mode mapping and colors. If you took these diseases to us and say, is it a disease or not, you say, yes, 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 no, no, no. But if you took them to people in another culture, they might say, no, 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 no. 
They wouldn't see these things. Road rage, what are you talking about? That's not a disease. So your culture shapes what you think is a disease and whether you think doctors should do something uh, about it. But when, which definition of health is used uh, can lead to contested labels. For example, in PMS and ADHD and hay fever, we see a tension between the social and statistical definitions of health. Because how can a majority of people be labeled as ill? So the majority of women might report PMS. Um, we are led to believe that the majority of boys in elementary school have ADHD. And a near majority of people might have hay fever. How can we say all of those people, in fact, the majority, are ill, have a disease, in fact? There's a tension between the social construction standard and the statistical standard in that type of a situation. And you guys were all over the map in your perceptions about what constituted disease and needed the attention of doctors. So short stature in childhood, 17% of you thought short kids uh, were a problem, were not, had a disease. 53% thought doctors should do something about it. PMS we already discussed. Colorblindness, 43% thought it was a disease. Many people are born colorblind by the adaptive standard. They have no problem. You guys label it a disease. 38% uh, think it's a concern of doctors. Pedophilia, 42% think it's a disease. Not moral failing, necessarily, a disease. And 47% a concern of doctors. A cocaine overdose, alarmingly, only 42% of you thought this was a disease. I don't know where the plan you guys are on. Uh, but thankfully, 96% of you thought that it was a concern about. The remaining 4% I'm really concerned about. Uh, obesity, 67 and 94. Blind is 70 and 84. Hip fracture, 61%. That's a serious condition, by the way. <laughs> I don't know what the other 39% are thinking, and 98% think it's a concern of doctors, and then alcoholism uh, at the bottom. But you're sort of all over the map in these things. There's a lot of disagreement among you guys as to what is and isn't a disease, and what is and isn't a legitimate concern by doctors. And I hope in section we'll discuss and actually argue about some of these things. Now let's take a closer look at one class of phenomena. These are deliberately placed within the, the set of things that you guys chose to be what I would consider to be ingestion. So smoking four packs a day, 35% of you thought it's a disease, and 82% a concern of doctors. Habitual cocaine use, 46 and 85. Alcoholism, 66 and 86. And lead poisoning, 61 and 98%. And at the bottom, I have some things that sort of contrast with that in interesting ways. So while 35% of you thought that smoking four packs a day was a disease, 96% thought that, 99% thought lung cancer was a disease. So you think the cancer is a, a disease, but the thing that causes it, not necessarily. Which is interesting that you make this distinction. Cocaine overdose, you think that uh, you have those opinions over there. 66% of you think that alcoholism is a disease, only 6% think a hangover is a problem. 10% want to see a doctor for it. That's another issue. Uh, and then you have the lead poisoning and Tylenol overdose examples that are shown there, where you think that lead poisoning is more likely to be a disease than a Tylenol overdose. By the way, Tylenol overdoses are fatal. You die from liver failure. And Tylenol is actually a very exceptionally dangerous drug. If you take more than 14 extra strength Tylenol tablets in a day, 50% of people will die if they don't get immediate medical attention. Yeah? What makes something a disease? Good, I'm not going to answer that. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so I want you to tell me now. What are some of the differences among these categories you think that, that matter to you people as you were assigning these uh, answers? Tell me what you think. What were key axes? What mattered? Yes? There was permanent genetics. Permanent, yeah. So one thing you see to matter is the chronicity or the permanency. That might be the reason hangover is not a disease, but alcoholism is a disease, for example. So you, one axis might have to do with the duration of the condition. So if it's a brief condition, that seems to matter. That's an important axis, perhaps. To you. What else? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, what was your name? First person here? Rosario. Rosario. And you're Gianna? Yeah? Um, Elaborate. What do you mean by that? Um, like, for example, Okay, so you think something that has a voluntary component might be less likely to be a disease than something that's involuntary. <coughs> From an external source. So, so something about, like, if you did it to yourself, we're going to be less likely to call it a disease. 
but, uh, but if someone else did it to you or the environment did it to you, that's going to count. Yeah, another idea. Okay, so you think that something that was important to you guys was the, the ability of the subject to resist the temptation, perhaps. Which, yeah? And that'll tip it into more being a disease. Something about that. What was your name? Leah. Leah, okay, thank you. Other ideas? Yes, behind you. Yes, Rosario, uh huh. Okay, so something about the immediacy of it, like the abruptness of onset might be real. What's your name? Tyler. Tyler, uh huh. Other ideas? Yeah? What's your name? Yes, seriousness, that's exactly right. D the deadliness of the condition also seemed to play a role in how you see. So all of these axes and many more you can discuss in section drove your willingness to partition the space, construct, it is or isn't a disease, it is or is not a legitimate concern of doctors. And the social construction issue also touches on the debate about medicalization we discussed a couple of weeks ago and to which we will return when we read and discuss Illich in a week or so. And it's interesting which problems you thought doctors should concern themselves with and which not. So for example, global warming, 11% thought that was a disease, 26% thought that, uh, that uh, doctors should be concerned about it. Uh, nuclear war, 7% a disease, 34% thought that doctors, sadness, compulsive gambling, uh, poverty, 20% thought that poverty was a disease, only 50% of you thought that doctors should be concerned about poverty. Look at hemorrhoids, guys. 81% of you think it's a disease, 94 percent, 95 of you think doctors should be concerned about hemorrhoids, but 50% think that they shouldn't be concerned about poverty. Which causes more problems in our society, do you think? Which leads to more health problems, poverty or hemorrhoids? And you, you guys are obsessed with hemorrhoids. <laughs> you really think that that should be a look at the attention doctors should give to hemorrhoids. And meanwhile, nuclear war, that's all right. <laughs> And now, so this is also really telling, uh, you know, why do you draw these distinctions? Why is one thing seen as, uh, if, if deadliness is so important, as you were mentioning earlier, if, what was your name? Ahmed. Ahmed. As Ahmed was saying, as deadliness is, uh, nuclear war should be off the charts in terms of, you know, and acuity. Boy, it, when it happens, it really packs a punch. Um, and we'll come back to this, too, when we talk about guns, for example. And, uh, yeah, uh, Michaela, what's your name? For, what? Ferdy? Birdie with a B? Birdie, yeah? Do you want me to tell you what a disease is still? I'm not going to do it yet. <laughs> what can doctors do about What can doctors do about poverty? We're going to learn. Yeah, because I think we can do a lot about those things. I think, in fact, we should be doing a lot about those things. I think that is where the source of illness and death and destruction is in our society. And I don't think the right heuristic is, I can treat hemorrhoids, that's what people do, no. is treat hemorrhoids. I think there's a better way you can think about how uh, doctors can use uh, their time. Hence, the social construction of illness leads to medicalization. And this process, which we also introduced a few lectures ago, now we're returning to, involves the following. It involves seeing doctors for progressively less serious conditions, seeing doctors for non-medical conditions, or the redefinition of such conditions to be under the purview of doctors and seeing doctors for normal parts of life experience. And by, and by some account, there's an epidemic of medicalization. So, so in a moment ago, I was arguing that doctors should see more things as they're within their purview. And now I'm highlighting what a problem might be with seeing more things under their purview. So as usual, I'm trying to get you to think about the attentions in some of these ideas. And this, and there can in fact be, as part of this medicalization idea, a kind of social iatrogenesis. A social iatrogenesis, which we'll return to in the next class. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, I'm sorry? Srija? Srija? Yes. That's right, so for example, acne. You know, when I was your age, most of us had acne, and, and there was little you could do about it. You know, clindamycin was just being tetracycline antibiotics. You know, you could buy Clearasil, which now you guys regard as pathetic. Uh, that was like the gold standard that we would surreptitiously go to the drugstore and buy. 
And now, most of you don't, if you look around, and even my classmates, a lot of the guys especially, but the women too, had a lot of pop marks on their faces. Now, maybe very few of you do that, except, out of that, except those of you that had a very particular kind of acne called cystic acne, and or didn't have access to the kinds of treatments that are available nowadays. So, defining acne, that would be medicalized. A hundred years ago, it was seen as a normal part of the human condition. Now, it comes to be medicalized. And in part, it's driven by the invention of treatments. When we invent treatments for a condition, we define the conditions as being a problem. Is it possible for someone to like, write that acne to the Yeah, some people look back in the past and that's what they say. That's right. They redefine. So hypertension is another example we gave earlier in the class. You know, up until 100 years ago when blood pressure cuffs were first invented, nobody knew about hypertension. There was no way of knowing if anyone had high blood pressure. Now we say, oh my goodness, people had high blood pressure for millennia. It's epidemics that were undiagnosed because we invented that technology. And here's a lot, list of conditions that have recently been medicalized. And we understand all of these things increasingly in medical terms, whereas formerly we may have understood them as non-medical problems. So PMS, for example, ADHD symptoms in children, erectile dysfunction, has been medicalized in your lifetimes. There are pills now for erectile dysfunction. There didn't used to be. A baldness. A short stature, acne, infertility, road rage, you guys medicalize road rage. Child abuse, you guys medicalize that. A substance abuse, gambling, poverty, and gun violence. And so medicalization is the, quote, progressive annexation of not illness into illness, to quote sociologist Renee Fox, as she put it in her terrific essay on the topic. Because health and illness have come to symbolize many positively and negatively valued biological, physical, social, cultural, and metaphysical phenomena. Increasingly, health is coming to be seen as a coded way of referring to any ideal state of affairs. And incidentally, a, a demedicalization movement has also arisen, questioning whether objective categories can be deduced about health and disease, and questioning whether, if illness is socially constructed after all, why it must be accepted. Part of this movement has focused on disempowering doctors and empowering patients, giving them rights to treatment, rights to privacy, rights to information, rights to life, rights even to death. So we can now have a, imagine a countervailing force that says, no, we are going to redefine these things as not being the concern of doctors, as not being illnesses. Actually, human beings should have these experiences and confront them on their own. So there can be a fight about the construction of this reality. Now consider, for example, the ostensible rise in ADHD in the United States in the last 20 years. An estimated 11% of children in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD at present. Between half and two-thirds of these are put on medications. So if you look at these rates over the last, you know, whatever it is, since the 1990s, this is the rate of office-based visits per thousand U.S. population. This is boys diagnosed with ADHD. Look at it skyrocketing. I don't think more boys have ADHD now than they used to. I think we're just diagnosing it more. And this is what's happening to girls. And then, of course, as we diagnose them, what do we do? We give them medications. We get into a situation where a part of human experience. Now, some might argue this is just like the sphingomanometer. We invent a technology, discover something that was there and legitimate, and treat it. Others might say, no, we're defining something into existence that we shouldn't be. And I don't know the answer. But I'm pointing out that this is a contended area. Figuring this out is a crucial part of medical care and public health. In fact, the United States is an outlier in the number of Ritalin prescriptions it gives to children. And the epidemic would appear to have struck us especially hard, which again comports with the idea of social construction. Why do we have this condition, but the Brits and the Germans and the French and the Australians do not, right? Maybe we're just defining it into existence. This chart shows global supply of ATG treatment drugs. Here's the United States in dark blue and the rest of the world. We are the largest consumers of these drugs of anyone on the planet. And in fact, 61% of you thought that ADHD was a disease, and 79% of you thought it was a concern of doctors. And if I had done the same instrument in another part of the world, I would have gotten completely different answers. You're defining it into existence. And something similar, in fact, is probably happening with autism, and we'll return to this idea later uh, in the class. Well, the question now is, do stimulants such as Ritalin actually improve meta-educational outcomes? So now, okay, so we define a condition, we take action, it compels us to take action, we administer drugs to people, does it change anything? Um, and this has been investigated using a natural experiment. 
Due to a policy change in 1997, children in Quebec had much greater access to Ritalin via their health insurance. So, uh, so this shows Ritalin use in natural experiments. Uh, and, and here on the x-axis is the prescriptions, and here is the time. And here's what happens in Quebec in the dark line, and here's what happens in the rest of Canada. So the rest of Canada, Ritalin use is not going up, but in Quebec, it is going up. And so now we can see, well, what happens to educational outcomes uh, if we treat this condition, do the kids in Quebec do better? Um, and what we find, actually, is that there was no benefit to educational outcomes. There was no improvement, despite the fact that we were now giving this drug so often. So an experiment that looks at the impact of this treatment, of natural experiments, finds no uh, benefit. It's the coefficient highlighted on the, on the lower part of the right-hand side. So let's now turn to childbirth. Having set the stage, so we've talked a little bit about ADHD and stuff like that. We've talked about plastic surgery. We've introduced menstruation. We've introduced the idea of social construction. We show, we've shown how it applies to phenomena outside of healthcare by looking at colors, by looking at uh, sounds, by looking at time and space and financial decisions. Let's now come back to Martin looking at the topic of women's health because I don't want you to think this is only relevant to women's health, although as I said at the beginning, that's a very powerful example. Now, 12% of you, I don't know, maybe you guys are joking, maybe you're just trying to irritate me, I have no idea. Uh, you're kind of mad at me, perhaps, I don't know. Why don't I have to take the stupid survey? 12% uh, of you thought that pregnancy was a disease state. <laughs> and 96% and of you thought it was a concern of doctors. And 8% of you thought birth itself was a disease state. <laughs> Excepting your own births, I'm assuming. And 93% uh, and of you thought it was a concern of doctors. And as Martin argues, notions of production run rife in this event, in childbirth, uh, as in the other she considered. And the pituitary is producing the hormones FSH and LH, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The ovary is producing estrogen and progesterone and eggs. And the uterus is producing lining and babies, but not menses. And all the while, hormones, eggs, embryos, and babies are transported from one place to another in part of this production metaphor. So we see the woman's body as a kind of machine that's doing something. Things are being manufactured and moved to another location, prompting the manufacture and production of something else, and the timing all of this can be studied and understood. And most of you probably thought that this was a completely normal way of seeing what is happening. And because of that, things like menstruation and menopause are seen as failures of production, and so elicit negative views. And in fact, menstruation is not just seen as a failure to produce a baby, but as production gone awry making products of no use, not to specification, or wasted. That if the woman's body really knew what it was doing and was doing the purpose for which it was designed, it would be producing a baby, not a bunch of blood. And so labor during childbirth can also be seen as failing. A woman may be seen as failing to progress and is merely participating in a production process that must be monitored and managed by the healthcare system. And this way of seeing the body seeing women's bodies this way as producing things as consequences. And that's, again, the key idea I want you to grasp today. Because women can become disconnected from their bodies, their bodies become fragmented, and then doctors intervene. So here's a woman that's going to have a baby today. And let's look at some of the consequences of seeing childbirth in a certain way as one of producing a baby. So what's happening in this picture? The woman is in a very stereotypical position with respect to having a baby. She's lying on her back. Her <coughs> knees are akimbo, and they're ready, getting ready to have a baby. What do you notice about this picture? Yeah. No one looking at her. What are they looking at? Some monitor that's monitoring some uh, parameter up on the screen, right? She is incidental now to the process. She has been kind of uh, uh, removed from her own experience in a way that Illich will also comment on in a while. She is draped and covered as, as if she's become just another machine that's producing a product in this type of a hospital uh, setting. And now here's the baby about to be born. Uh, and that's the moment, you know, the dramatic moment of the birth of this person's uh, child. And as Martin points out, the delivery can be mapped as a production process. And this is a different flow diagram than the one in your book, but it's also taken from a medical source. And the mere fact that there is such a flow diagram is itself interesting and suggestive. And see, if you look at what's happening here, um, so here's, here's a woman, she's you know, preparing for pregnancy. Uh, and then she has a conception. Uh, and then there's a suspected pregnancy. And then it's a confirmed pregnancy. 
Uh, and then now it comes time to manage the pregnancy and enter labor and delivery. And now she enters labor and delivery, and she's in a whole world of her. Because she could either have a planned vaginal delivery and a spontaneous labor and routine progress, and then she gets to have a vaginal birth. But anything else doesn't leave there. She could have a planned vaginal delivery, spontaneous labor, but there could be a failure to progress, which requires augmentation, and then she, uh, it doesn't work, and she has a C-section. Or she has an emergent complication, which has a C-section. Or she can have induced labor, and then luckily have routine progress, but that's unlikely. More likely, she'll have failure to progress and have a C-section, or an emergent complication of a C-section, or she can have a planned C-section and have a C-section, and basically everything is leading to a C-section, and like the routine gradual birth is totally forgotten in this picture. The whole image, the whole construction of what's happening is now guiding the care that is given uh, to this person. And in fact, so many arrows lead to C-section with so much failure to progress. About 30% of uh, deliveries of, uh, as of 10 years ago in the United States is shown in lower right, were by C-section. So, so our ideas about what delivery is like, our social construction of this very normal biological process have implications, lead us to action, like doing all the things on this chart, precisely because we define concepts like normal labor and failure to progress. We define them, and then we act on them. And there may be, in fact, nothing objective about these landmarks at all. These may be socially constructed out of thin air with no evidence basis whatsoever. Just like the example of menstruation I gave you at the beginning, this is just a way of seeing, of constructing this experience. <coughs> and these are some images taken from your readings regarding a woman undergoing a C-section. Uh, so here it is. This is now an incision has been made. Usually it's made uh, laterally in the abdomen. This is a big retractor that's opening the woman's abdominal wall. Then an incision is made in the uterus. Uh, and then the baby's about to be removed through the abdomen of, the, of this woman. Here the baby's coming out, so exciting. Now the doctors are proceeding. The baby's been moved over to the far left there in the little incubator and warming area. Now they're suturing her up. That's a little layer of fat tissue you're seeing here. So under this little sort of little bottle here is the subcutaneous fat. And now they're sort of suturing up uh, uh, the woman. And, uh, and that's the birth of a baby. Uh, in a kind of a C-section. And there are more pictures uh, in the reading that we're assigned for today. And many practices that are very widely adopted uh, based on our conceptions of female labor actually, when subject to randomized controlled trials, eventually show little or no benefit. So, all the, so we define labor in this way. We become accustomed to doing things to women when they're in this normal process because we think of the process as a production metaphor of Marx art. And then for years we do these things, and then scientists come along and do a randomized control trial to see whether those things made any sense. And you know what they find out? No sense. It's just like the ADHD example. You give all the riddle and does it help educational outcomes? No. You define failure to progress in these ways and you do things. Does it help women and babies? No, when you actually do the science. So here's some examples. Electronic fetal heart monitoring, a randomized control trial in 1990, finds no improvement in neurologic development of prematurely born children. Induction of labor, large RCT, finds slight reduction in cesarean section rate, no effect on perinatal or neonatal or mor morbidity or mortality. Active management of labor, no effect. Monitoring fetal oxygen saturation levels during labor, no effect on the rate of cesarean sections, no effect on condition of the newborn. All those equipment that were in that room, most of that equipment that we thought made sense that you should monitor the oxygen level of the baby, when you do the randomized control trial, no effect. Okay. So this is not, we are spending billions of dollars, we are strapping women down, we are doing all of these things because we construct a kind of idea about what normal childbirth should be like. And contrast all this we have seen like this. So here's Mark says, what if you reverse the genders? If your husband was told that he had to get an erection and ejaculate within a certain time, or he'd be castrated, do you think he would be easy? To make it easier, perhaps he could have an IV put into his arm, be kept in one position, have straps placed around his penis, and be told not to move. He could be checked every few minutes. The sheet could be lifted to see if any progress uh, was being made. And this is what Martin says. She says, imagine if the genders were reversed and we, had a you know, we described the process uh, for men. And as she notes, this strikes us as ridiculous. And yet, as she also documents, women, women in labor are often put in structurally analogous circumstances. And if you think I'm kidding, there is uh, an epidemic, not an epidemic, frequently I encounter examples of female prisoners shackled during delivery. Here's a photograph of this woman with her baby. You see that? She's shackled here. 
prison often shackles pregnant inmates in labor. Why might we do this? Because we see women in a different way uh, in labor. So it doesn't seem so crazy that we would shackle them uh, while they're delivering their babies. There was just another case of this that was just in the news a week or so ago. I think I sent it to you, I can't remember. So this has consequences. How we see women results in these kinds of things. Now, I'm a doctor, obviously, and some of this stuff that I've been discussing is fairly mundane to me, and I've tried to show you only tame and reasonably discreet images today, but there are more pictures in Martin's book, of course, and on the internet that can give you an idea of how mechanized and dehumanized this process can truly become. And here's another example of the consequences of the way we socially construct childbirth. So episiotomy is an incision that's made in the perineum from the vagina towards the anus during vaginal delivery. So now we're, this is a, a shot looking up at a woman's uh, perineum. Uh, this is the vagina, and this is the anus, these are her legs. And uh, this is the scissors, that's what you're seeing there, scissors uh, that are being used to do what is a medial lateral episiotomy. In the old days, they used to cut straight down, but this would often damage the anal sphincter, and then the woman would often have incontinence afterwards and problems with her bowels because of what the doctor did. And this incision was made in a very common and standard way in an effort to avoid tearing. Because often when women deliver babies, uh, when the baby comes out, the perineum tears. There's a tear that occurs. And the thinking was, well, if we just do the snipping in advance, uh, there won't be a tear. It'll be a much more hygienic, surgical kind of a thing that happens. And this was done with good intentions to, uh, to help women. And this was a routine procedure in the United States for nearly a century. Roughly half of American women have this done to them at the time of delivery. But in the past decade, studies have provided strong evidence that postpartum pain is less with spontaneous lacerations than with episiotomies. And studies have also shown that women return to sexual functioning earlier with intact perineums or spontaneous tears compared to women who had episiotomies. The belief that episiotomy prevents damage to the pelvic floor has not been substantiated. In fact, midline episiotomy significantly increases the risk of anal sphincter laceration, which then can cause the problems I alluded to earlier. And I would suggest that one of the reasons that episiotomy became so common is that our views of women's bodies as a machine is our views of women's bodies as a machine producing a baby. A machine that sometimes needs a little engineering and modification to get the baby to come out on schedule. Right? Or just, I'm the, gonna, you know, flip some switches here, make some little cuts and nips, and everything's going to just come out like, like a chip. Um, and further evidence of the social construction of the need for episiotomy comes from its telling variability. Women who deliver their babies attended by a physician in private practice undergo an episiotomy 67% of the time, compared to women attended by a hospital faculty physician who undergo one 18% of the time. What's the difference there? In the former, the doctor is paid for the episiotomy. In the latter, he is not. So the compensation practice can also have effects. And in fact, there's very large international variation, with some wealthy countries having an 8% rate and others having a nearly 100% rate in this episiotomy. Once again, the point by now should be very, very clear. And just as there is a resurgent interest in natural death in the last 30 years, as we'll discuss, as we were going to discuss uh, next week, but we're going to skip that lecture, there's also been a resurgent interest in natural childbirth. Martin discusses this at length, and you will find more pictures there. But note the difference between this image, this is one image, and the one we saw earlier. What's the difference here? Some differences between this picture of a childbirth and the one we saw before. Yeah, what's your name? Emma. Emma. <laughs> right, it's pretty obvious, we're all looking at her. Who do you think the guy on the left is? Husband, dad, yeah, he's, you know, he's like, you know, she's doing her thing right now. I'm right here to support her, but there's not a lot that I can do to make the situation better. <laughs> so he's near, but not too near. Uh, just out of arm's length, you know, you did this to me, you son of a bitch. Uh, and, uh, and what else is different about this woman? Yeah, Emma? Yeah, she's standing. She's standing up to deliver baby. Since, which women have done since time immemorial. It's much easier to deliver babies standing up uh, than lying on your back. And Martin discusses this uh, at length. And finally, she's also in her own home. Uh, she's not in, uh, in, in the hospital. Yeah, what's your name? Yeah. Srija again, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, 
is what? I think, I don't know how much pain she's in, although I have no doubt she's in. To me, she looks like she's straining right now. She's trying to deliver that baby. But yeah, the other one was all happy and smiling. Yeah, that's a good difference. Do you think that's a general difference? Who knows? Yeah, this is why it's difficult. We'll come, in a minute, I'm going to come back to why it's not quite so simple as the dramatic story I've been telling the last 15 minutes. Yes, um, Rosario. It like the environment is, the environment with the other doctors is very sterile. The very is clean. It's mm -hmm. just kind of like normal hands and... Yeah, so you're worried about like the sterility here, uh huh? That's good. <coughs> other things? We'll come back to the sterility thing in just a moment. Now, this, this sort of delivering the baby standing up is atavistic, of course, and it's been a mode of delivering babies since time immemorial. That's a petroglyph from Australia that's, I don't know, 20,000 years old on the far left. There's an Egyptian uh, woman that used to uh, sit these birthing chairs. Here's a more modern aboriginal uh, drawing. And, and even in medieval Europe, there's a special stool there with like a gap in the, in the middle, and the woman would sit on the stool uh, to deliver uh, the baby. And conceptual models of treatment, conceptual, our conceptual models of what counts as a disease and of what the biology is, affect treatment. And there are many examples outside women's health and plastic surgery and mental health that we've considered uh, today. For example, there's a notion of stress ulcer ulcers. So when I was in medical school, uh, it was still sort of, it was the tail end of a system of beliefs that ulcers in the stomach were due to people being stressed, that you were stressed, it increased the sympathetic drive. Sympathetic drive re releases more acid in the stomach, and the acid is causing an ulcer. Now, it turns out that that was totally wrong. A uh, guy won the Nobel Prize, and a couple of people in, in uh, Australia, from the deducing that actually what was causing ulcers was more likely an infection with a bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, uh, and that actually you could treat ulcers in a completely different way with antibiotics. And that our conception of the causes of a stress ulcer was leading us to treat it in a different, and as it turned out, uh, incorrect way. When I was in training as a resident, if people had, uh, if people, we, we had EKG monitors. And so we could look at people's heart rate after when they were in the hospital. And we got all obsessed with monitoring their heart rate all the time. And, um, and after they had a heart attack, the heart muscle is stunned and isn't working. And you have something known as premature ventricular contractions. So there could be these occasional spikes, these aberrant heartbeats. And you can count them and monitor them and see them on the traces. And we would spend a lot of our time seeing these things. And when, because there was this abnormality that we could now detect, we became convinced that we needed to stop it. And so drugs like, so, like flecainide and enconide became widely available and used for thousands of patients to stop, to stabilize the myocardium and the electrical properties of the heart and to stop these premature ventricular contractions. Years later, trials were done, and it was, turned out we were killing the patients by giving them these uh, drugs. There was no reason to stop just because we could detect these PVCs and formed the opinion that this was a disease state and therefore decided to treat them with these drugs doesn't mean we're doing uh, the right thing. Radical mastectomy is another example. Uh, for years it was the practice when a woman had breast cancer to remove the whole breast and do this dissection up to her axilla and remove uh, the nodes and often remove part of the pectoral muscle. Uh, very extensive procedure and many years later it was shown that actually you don't need to remove the whole breast. You can do lumpectomy and radiation, so-called breast conserving surgery. More conservative is equally effective. And there are many other metaphors that you guys probably take for granted. Some of you have taken courses. Raise your hands if you've studied immunology in any of your classes. And probably if you studied immunology you were taught, you were taught to think about the immune system as engaged in a war. You have natural killer cells and immune resistance, and armies of immune cells that are marching to, you know, attack uh, the invaders and so forth. There are all these militaristic metaphors that you've taken for granted about how the immune system works. But they're all metaphors. There's no reason why you have to think of the immune system in working that way. But you're thinking about the immune system that way, which you may take naturally, then prompts you to approach the world and do things to patients uh, in a different kind of a way. Now, I have a couple of ideas I want to finish with. It's very important because I'm often misunderstood when I talk about this topic. Because I need to be very clear about something. It's not the case, it is not the case, that modern healthcare is not beneficial. And that all we need to do is return to some natural time or place for childbirth. So the point of today's lecture was not to suggest to you that in the olden days they treated women right and they saw women right and everything was hunky-dory and now you know, we see women as machines and we're abusing them in the hospital and shackling them and so forth.
That's not the case. And here are some devastating WHO uh, statistics. This is maternal mortality. The woman dies, dies, by region in 2000. So per 100,000 live births over the world as a whole, there are 400,000 women die per 100 live births. And in the world as a whole, lifetime risk of a woman dying is nearly 1 in 100. 1 in 74 women over the course of their lives around the world will die because they're delivering a baby. But there's enormous variation. So you guys live in a, in a part of the world, like Europe or the developed regions of the world, where actually women are very unlikely to die. One in nearly 3,000 women will die as a result of delivering a baby, and fewer than 20 per 100,000 live births uh, die. And most of you probably don't know anyone who's died in childbirth. Some of you might, which is very sad. But now look at what happens in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Sub-Saharan Africa, one out of 100 women die with each birth. 920 out of 100,000 live births. And lifetime risk, one out of 16 women will die as a result of delivering a baby in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's not so simple, right? It's not so simple as just saying, oh, you know, all of this stuff, the hygiene that some of you mentioned and the technology and everything else is just this sort of art, you know, artificial, unnecessary social construction which can just be ignored. And in fact, the WHO Safe Motherhood Initiative regarding the provision of basic health care in this domain, unfortunately did not. A worldwide initiative to try to improve the state of affairs did not have the success that it should have. And a certain small percentage of women need serious advanced medical care on short notice or they die. And maternal mortality in Africa is shockingly high. And in fact, the challenge, as in so much of this course, and in this talk that we've had today in particular, the challenge is to separate social construction from what is scientifically beneficial and essential and positivistically determinable. And in a way, the challenge of being a doctor is to know when to respond to the statistical, when to respond uh, to the normative, and when to respond to the adaptive standard of health. And my point is not that we have to somehow simplify things in a silly way and say that the fact that things are socially constructed means that there's no science or medicine or to put these concepts into some kind of false opposition to each other. So what I want, another thing I want you to come away from today is the recognition that it's not as if either things are socially constructed or they're seen in a scientifically you know, hyper-rational way. Both are true. And it's one of the in, in, in kind of irresolvable tensions that, that certainly I've faced in my career and that you're going to face, I hope, as you struggle with the material. These are some of the leading causes of maternal mortality uh, worldwide. Uh, so what causes women to die around the world? 25% of women die from severe bleeding, 15% uh, from infection, 13% from unsafe abortions. Totally ridiculous. 12% uh, from eclampsia, that's a, a natural condition of high blood pressure and clotting disorders that occurs in many women. 8% from obstructed labor, there can be no more horrible death in my judgment than death from obstructed labor. We have Neanderthal, um, just heartbreaking, just heartbreaking, uh, skeletons of women who died in childbirth, you know, 100,000 years ago with the baby stuck in their pelvis, also dead, uh, mother and child buried uh, together. Other direct causes, 8%, uh, and indirect causes, 20% uh, shown in this pie chart. And these kinds of problems, eclampsia, bleeding, unsafe abortion, and infection, don't respond to midwives with kids, nor should we define them as non-problems because they are somehow natural. It's, it's nothing unnatural about dying of obstructed childbirth. But it's not a good thing at all. And they can indeed be prevented with low-cost interventions, for example, to reduce infection or unsafe abortion, though they cannot be eliminated uh, simply. And what's challenging about what I'm telling you today is that these things are complex. The Martin critique is one of the best, and in my judgment, spot on. But I want to challenge you even more because there's also a reality. There's the reality of maternal and fetal death. And what we want is the best of both worlds. And in my judgment, it should be possible to have it. And that's, in fact, one of the things that's so hard about being a doctor. Because you're really trying to integrate what's, what it is scientifically sound and what it is to be human. And you don't always know what's right. And information is conditional and tentative, and it's changing uh, all the time. OK. Questions? Yeah, what's your name? Marissa. Marissa.
She wasn't shackled. The prisoner was shackled. But she was, you know, she was almost shackled. Yeah. Um, I'm, wait, I'm sorry, you said the prisoner who was, I'm sorry, who, I'm sorry. Who, the you, oh, the prisoner. Yeah, she was shackled. Yes. Was yes. Okay. She had just given birth, but she had been shackled while okay. giving birth. Yes. Um, I think it has to do with the way we see women and the, and the birth process more than the prison system. Anyone who actually paused for a moment knows that a woman in the midst of delivering a baby is not going to make a getaway. I mean, <laughs> she's not going to make a run for it. <laughs> so I just think it's a kind of blindness to, I mean, really, man, have you ever, have you ever thought about delivering a baby or seen it in a movie? I mean, you know, come on. Um, so yeah, so I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's sexist, frankly. I just think it's just, just rank sexism. That's what I think. I mean, it has to do with that. We don't treat all of our prisoners well. For example, prison rape is taken to be as a kind of a, a comedy, right? Like you think, oh, prison rape is ha ha ha. No, no, actually. That's a failure in our civilization. If we institutionalize people, incarcerate them, and think that somehow it's okay for them to be raped, uh, it's not. Okay, I'm talking about men here primarily, well, but women too, of course. So that's a failure of the prison system, and also a, a kind of consequence of certain ideas of masculinity, and also of like, of diminished masculinity. You know, you're a prisoner now, and so you deserve to be abused in some way. Yeah? Are these costs common in places that are under and like Yeah, there'll be a difference. So, so the pie is much smaller in our country, obviously, because we had like whatever it was, one in 3,000 women die in childbirth compared to one in 1,000 in, in Afghanistan. Uh, but, uh, and the distribution of the pie will also be different from place to place. So the women who die here will have different things. But these are the main causes of death. If conditional on dying, these are the kinds of things that kill you when you're dying. Any other questions? Yes, what's your name? Bruce. Bruce. Brooks, uh huh. Going back to last week, I was wondering. Yeah. So I, I wrote a book about this, which I used to teach in the class, but I don't anymore, called Death Foretold. So if you're really interested, you could, you know, I hate it, I hate it, Professor. This is what I was at school. You're like, go read this whole book instead of answering my question. And it was my book, too, so it really should be. So I'm not saying, I'm going to answer your question. Uh, but I'm just saying there's an enormous literature on this topic. And so my answer is the following. Uh, when it comes to things like prognosis, I think that it's a really helpful strategy with what I used to do with my patients is I would go to them and I would say to them, patients vary in how much information they want. Some patients want to know everything about their condition, and some patients don't want to know anything about their condition. What kind of patient are you? And let the patient, the patient says, doc, I don't want to hear a thing. You know? That's a different statement than doc, tell me everything. I'm not saying that we need to ram the horrible truth down every unwilling patient's throat. You know, don't tell me, I must tell you the bad news. No, don't tell me that, I am going to tell you. you know? <laughs> That's not what I'm suggesting. So I think plus, the other thing that's often misunderstood in a kind of cartoonish portrayal of medical care is that people think that it's like in the movies where the doctor has one interaction with a patient. But of course, that's not what real medicine is generally ought to be like or is like, especially in this type of a serious situation. So you have a series of conversations. So the first conversation, the patient says, you know, I don't want to know anything. Then you go back a week later, two weeks later, and you say, you know, when I saw you a week ago, you were, you were walking. And now, you know, it seems like you're spending most of your time in bed. And, I'm wondering whether you'd like to know a little bit more about what I think is likely to happen. No, doc, I just don't want to hear anything. You know, last week you weren't yellow. This week you're yellow. You're, you have icterus. You know, you're, you're, you're yellow like a, like a banana yellow. Have you noticed this? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be so flippant. But, you know, you, that, the patient is getting information about their condition and you give them a renewed opportunity. In very short terms, and I'll say one more thing and then I'll let you go. The other thing that is so crucial in talking to patients which is so overlooked and it's just so basic and human, is that what patients really want is assurance that you're not going to abandon them. One of the reasons that doctors and patients avoid end of life consider conversations is because both parties think that to talk about it means the doctor's going to abandon me now because he can't fix me. Or the doctor thinks, you know, if I tell them the bad news, you know, that means that there's nothing else for me to do. And so I think one of the simplest things doctors can do when talking to people about serious illness is to say, I'm going to talk about some serious things now but I want to assure you that I will not abandon you, that I will take care of you in the best way I can for whatever life you have remaining. 
And I think that is so important in medical care. See you guys next time.